be talking about how she was radicalized by Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> Get your Americans at the ready. It's Elaine Miller. Thank you. I have a slight problem because now that I'm trying to uh, portray myself as a serious politician, <laughs> the use of the word radicalized is apparently ill-advised. I've decided to state instead that I was galvanised by Holyrood, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I thought I would tell you about how that happened. Um, I peaked a long time ago because I work in women's health. Like, so I see injustices that are meted out to women by medical misogyny for 30 years. And um, it gets a little bit wearing after a while. Um, medical misogyny is really well understood. You know, it's embedded into medicine since medicine began. And to be fair to the medical institutions, they are working really hard to try and fix this, but it's 2,000 years and it takes a wee while. <laughs> <laughs> so this sort of le just leads to women suffering. You know, the lack of a diagnosis, the lack of being heard, um, of getting respect and bodily autonomy, it causes suffering and it's really not okay. So I set about speaking up in the system because I'm gobby and I would meet with MSPs and budget holders and give my opinion and <laughs> for reasons unclear, they listened or they appeared to but nothing changed. So then I started speaking to MSPs and I, I presented in Holyrood and in Westminster and the House of Lords and I thought I was getting somewhere. But then, this time last year, on International Women's Day, my Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robson, said in Parliament that um, Eva quoted her at the very beginning of the day, so it seems rather apt that the same quote has been builded out at the end, that no man would ever seek to pretend to be something that he's not in order to do harm to women. And I watched it on the, the, the parliamentary TV and I just lost my temper. Because I thought these people, they're not listening. And they're not going to listen because this is a woman saying this and she knows that there's harm being done. She knows because I've told her civil servant, she knows. So I thought, right, these people are not going to stand up for me. So I'm not going to play the game anymore by trying to change things from within the system. I'll say what I think publicly. And I've been invited here. So... <laughs> What have you done, Fourth Valley Feminists? <laughs> so I had a speech that was actually quite good. <laughs> and then I changed my mind as I was listening to the other women speaking, because they're amazing. How do you get these, like, they've got such good contact, contacts. And I changed what I was going to say, and I landed up saying something kind of pretty much off the cuff. And um, it felt much more comfortable. I really liked it. It's quite nice being out. <laughs> Women need single-sex spaces. I know that because of work. Women need privacy, safety and dignity to get their health needs taken care of. And for some women it's even more important. Women with learning disabilities, for instance, are seven times more likely to be raped than a woman who doesn't have a learning disability. Seven times. And we just accept this as being, well, it's routine. It's just what happens. These women are vulnerable. It's not okay. I want privacy to deal with my menopausal clots that keep falling out of me at inconvenient times, thanks very much. I don't really want to have a man listening to me try and deal with this, because it's just off-putting. And um, for the lesbian women that have lost their ability to just meet with each other without the prospect of somebody who is of a different sex, it's their same-sex attracted women. They don't need to have somebody of a different sex there. It's really unreasonable. However, as Lucy said, when a woman says no in our society, they don't get heard. We have no dignity. It is not respected. So, what does that, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I've got scrappy writing. See, see when I'm living in Butte House, I have a wee man. <laughs> type this out so I can read it because I've got the wrong glasses on as well and these are the ones I sat on so they're squint. 
dead classy. Um, <laughs> right, in August 21, Nicola Sturgeon said that she wanted Scotland to be global leaders in women's health. And I thought, brilliant, that sounds magic. However, I'm not sure how they can manage to provide that if they can't define what women is. It's not possible to build services unless you know who you're providing them for. She also promised us 18 months ago that we would have a women's officer for health. That would be handy. Hasn't been nominated yet. And Susan Dogetti thought that I could have the job. <laughs> I'd be quite good at it. Can you imagine the civil servant's face if they open a job application? I, I guess a job. <laughs> I can provide my own American. Um, <laughs> If 50% of women in Scotland don't know the difference between their vulva and their vagina, why do we assume that our female elected representatives would? Why do we assume that they know anything at all about female anatomy? They are as ignorant as the rest of us because we don't provide this information. But unfortunately, they have to make decisions. And I think that without the basic information, and with the cosh of a party manifesto, some of the decisions aren't very wise. So I wrote a comedy show, Viva Your Vulva, the whole story, about what a vulva is and what it does and how to look after it. And it won, uh, got five stars. Thanks very much. Twice. <laughs> And, um, and it sold out mainly because I ended up being accused of transphobia and a bunch of women rescued me. <laughs> and um, they just spoke, they came to help with flyers and it was deeds not words in action. I didn't ask for the help, I just passed comment of I'm really struggling to publicise this and this army of women scooped it up and fixed the problem. It was really lovely. And the thing about that is you pay it forward, don't you? So yeah, I'm very grateful. The reason I was accused of transphobia is because the show was about people with vulvas. So that was women, and I included people with vulvas who don't consider themselves to be women. So I included trans men, I included people that are non-binary identified females, because they are female. But I didn't include trans women, because they didn't have a vulva. <laughs> you know, it's a 55 minute show. And I got asked in an interview about this problem, I said, I also didn't include 17th century French architecture. Because <laughs> it also doesn't have a vulva, it's 50, 55 minutes, it's not, it's not very long. Anyway, that was the crime. And for that, me and the audience were, were TERFs. We were, um, the staff in the venue said that we had a TERF vibe. It all got quite heated and unpleasant. And then I got harassed in the street and yada, yada, yada. Now, I had been active within this in as far as I had been writing emails and I'd been email, uh, emailing people and I had been, you know, submitting to crowdfunders and all of that sort of thing. But because of what happened in August, I landed up in the second committee hearing um, watching Shona Robinson ignore evidence that I had sent in when it was being submitted by an MSP, who was saying something that she didn't want to hear because it didn't fit with their party position, they'd already made their decision. And it was genuinely shocking. I'm sitting there watching this woman who's paid quite a lot of money to consider evidence and make a wise decision, and she was performing like I did in chemistry when I was 15, because I didn't want to be there. It was the most extraordinary thing to witness. A senior politician, a senior minister, she has power, she has influence, and she's going, <sighs> and she was doodling. <laughs> it was the doodling that tipped me over. <laughs> Do you know, I could have tolerated the huffing and puffing, thinking, right, okay, it's a performance, I get it, it's like a pantomime, okay, I've seen that. But the, the sitting doodling so that she wasn't listening, I just couldn't, couldn't bear it. 
um, because I knew that what she was dismissing was information that would do harm, not just to women and girls, but to the people in the trans community as well, because the standard of evidence to support their care is not good enough. But she wouldn't listen. So I interrupted and I asked the chair if he had any power to get the cabinet secretary to pay attention to the evidence. Because what she's doing, what she's doing, mister, is doodling. <laughs> So I said my bit and I left and I burst into tears and a very nice policeman gave me a wee hug and a glass of water. He was very nice. I've changed the opinion since. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I went and got myself a cup of tea. In that time, between me coming out <laughs> I'm so angry and getting a cup of tea, J.K. Rowling had tweeted that I had spoken for all women and girls in Scotland. I know. <laughs> But then, quick as a flash, because they're awful fast, you lot on Twitter, Ali tweeted, she's adorable. And J.K. Rowling responded, I couldn't love that woman more if she had an otter strapped to her head. <laughs> and Mr. Ben made me an otter on a headband with a wee t-shirt. And she's printed out J.K. Rowling's tweet on the t-shirt so I can wear it on the head. <laughs> um, I'm just delighted. <laughs> How perfect is that? It's like great. She's so talented. So thank you, Mr. Ben, and um, thank you, J.K. Rowling, because. <laughs> it would never have happened otherwise. <laughs> there was a lot of jokes about why didn't she say beaver because that would have fit her. <laughs> Apparently she likes otters. I'm delighted. Um, so, the next morning after I interrupted the, the session, Karen Adam, who is um, an SNP MSP, said on Twitter, that she'd had a very difficult day at work because it'd been very hard to watch a woman being abused in the workplace. And the SNP people who like Karen Adam, and there's quite a few of them, or at least there was, she's, she's now not on Twitter for reasons unclear, um, they, they were shocked and horrified by this outrageous, that somebody had abused a woman in the workplace. And then um, I responded, saying, um, that's me that you're talking about, and you're misrepresenting what I did. There was no profanity, I didn't raise my voice, I didn't make any personal remarks, and I'm sorry that a woman has felt abused in the workplace. I don't want that to happen, because it's not about how I feel, the, my inter interruption, like what it meant, it's about how it's perceived. So if this is the case, I need to fix them. So Karen blocked me. <laughs> I had been accused of a crime of abusing a woman on a public forum by an elected representative who blocked me, wouldn't answer my emails at all. She made herself unaccountable for her actions of accusing me of a crime. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> I didn't think I could get more angry at that point. <laughs> and then I watched my MSPs vote to protect the desires of male people over the needs of incarcerated women. And I just thought, this is getting out of hand, like my blood pressure cannot take much more of this. I mean, it's fine to be angry in the chamber, but if you actually have a stroke right here, it's, it's not going to put a damp on things, you know? I need to fix this. Those women have the rights to safety and privacy and dignity, and those elected representatives just didn't care. They voted in state-sanctioned rape, and I will never forgive them.
Now, I am not politically engaged until now, but I did know that the SNP needed to get this vote through because they were relying on the Greens, and I'm not sure why this is so important to the Green Party, because I thought that they liked trees. But <laughs> I had watched Nicola Surgeon sit with her back to us for three days, and I thought, I'm going to get your attention. <laughs> I did. <laughs> So, because of my work, right, because I work in women's health, I knew about Anna Saima, this um, ancient protest of women raising their skirt when they've got something to say. It's not, I knew that I couldn't expose myself in Parliament, because at first I was going to moon them. Um, <laughs> but I thought, nakedness, that's a crime, that's, too, that's taking it too far. Um, but I do have quite a large <laughs> um, craft box full of stuff left over from when the children were little. So I thought, I bet I've got some funky fur in there, and I made myself American. But I also knew that if I did this, I would have to defend it, because I could get arrested, I could get reported to my governing body, I would probably have to explain my actions. So there's a Sharon Owens poem, Dangerous Coats, about how you need to make coats with pockets, because that's where you put your sedition. So I put a pocket in the back of the American <laughs> for my sedition, just as a wee joke to myself. And um, I figured, like, lifting the skirt is a socially acceptable thing for men that are wearing kilts to do in Scotland. It's actually okay to expose your penis if you're wearing a kilt and you're at a wedding and it's at that time, just before the fight, you know. <laughs> you're allowed to expose yourself if you're a man. So I thought, if you're going to take away my sex-based rights, I'll behave like a man. So... And there was about a minute between clap, 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 we love you, Beth. And, um, and I lifted my skirt. And I had thought, right, I'll say something about, you know, it's not ideal to allow women to be raped in jails. Um, I don't think that's decent, so I'll be indecent. And then a bit of Glasgow slipped right out. <laughs> Get it right, fuck you! I'm never that angry again in my life because I nearly got out of control. The most remarkable thing that happened, because I do comedy, right, so I'm used to looking at a room and seeing how it's behaving. Every single one of those MSPs were looking at me. And Nicola Sturgeon turned her head. to do was create a fuss right there in the chambers, hopefully get it into some of the Scottish press, maybe I could get it into the paper, maybe there would be some feminist tweet about it for maybe three days. Because you know, it's Christmas is coming and I haven't done anything for Christmas because I've been too busy sitting in Parliament and I've got all these folk coming in to sort out some sheets and you know, a turkey. Anyway, Christmas kind of got hijacked because an MSP recorded my carefully thought out protest and um, it, was, it was against the rules, they're not allowed to record anything while Parliament's in session, but Parliament had been suspended. <gasps> he didn't actually break any rules. Isn't that amazing? I don't know if he'd realised that at the time. And I don't know how that video landed up in the Daily Mail. Um, and it was unfortunate that the first thing that my husband knew about this was <laughs> when he had a wee break from his work and he clicked in the Daily Mail. Wasn't the ideal. Um, <laughs> and my children, um, my teenage children at peak awkward stage, um, they, they got it either from the front page of Reddit, um, oh, I was in trouble. <laughs> I, if you don't use Reddit, it gets voted up and voted down. I didn't know that. So there's my fanny on the front of Reddit and three teenage kids standing on their phone. 
And the top comment was, imagine if that was your mom. <laughs> My kids are brutal and they're like that. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Ooh, Christmas was spicy. <laughs> My poor father. <laughs> you know, it's pals at the rugby club, you know, West Coast of Scotland rugby club men, they do not tend to be, you know, used to that sort of thing. Wally, is that you to lean? <laughs> So, I got some feedback um, <laughs> from my family, and then I got some feedback from Twitter, um, which could be summarised with, I am the wrong sort of woman. I am too old. I am too fat. I am too loud. I have the wrong opinions. And my favourite one, I've got no manners. <laughs> Endless, like it was an onslaught. I have no idea how people manage it. It was really quite something. And all I kept reading was, I'm the wrong sort of woman, but I am a woman. <laughs> Wait, what do I care that a bunch of people that I don't know don't like me very much? I've got loads of pals. <laughs> I had a series of men who wanted to explain to me in quite a lot of detail exactly why they didn't want to have a sexual relationship with me. <laughs> Just, I can't even take this seriously. <laughs> Darling, you live in Texas. I can cope with your rejection from the other side of the Atlantic. You weren't the invited anyway. I was called a flasher, a paedophile, a sex pest, including by Ross Greer, MSP. He said on Twitter that I had flashed and should be reported. So I messaged him. And I said, um, does your phone not do well on one? Like, if you actually think that I'm a threat and that I've committed a sexual offence, why have you not reported me to the police? That's your duty as a citizen. So he doesn't answer any of my emails either. <laughs> I don't know when it became acceptable for an MSP to just not respond <laughs> after they've accused somebody of a crime on a public forum. This is not okay. <laughs> anyway, somebody did report me, um, according to the press. The police have never spoken to me about it. But I heard also from the press that there was no, there was no crime committed um, because the, there was no nakedness. It wasn't, if you're flashing, you have to have nakedness and sexual motivation. And I can assure you, I was in no way turned on. <laughs> there was nothing in that chamber that gave me a wee tingly feeling anywhere. Oh, blood pressure, good grief. Heckler at the front says, what about Russell Finlay? <laughs> That's because I let him have a wee stroke of American. <laughs> uh, I, should, I should probably clarify because the man is married. It was on a pub table at the time, wasn't he? <laughs> he was very firm but gentle. spent quite a lot of time putting photographs of me through some sort of weird algorithm that superimposes a man's skeleton onto me and they have pr proved beyond all doubt that I am in fact a man. <laughs> Hilarious. Five stars. None of it bothered me. Like genuinely I'm surprised. I think I'm just, you know that glorious, is it Gloria Steinem that said the older women they get, uh, the older women get the more radical they become. I don't care. I'm quite old now. I'm quite pleased with myself. I, um, I wanted to demonstrate to the Scottish Parliament that these women have engaged in the democratic process. We did what the rules say we have to do. 
We followed it to the letter for years. There is a whole battalion of women emailing and making appointments and turning up and protesting. We tried and you didn't listen. So the gloves are off and the pants. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's not okay. So then this really funny thing happened. Um, some of the, the, the women are quite strategic that are in this movement and they noticed there was a by-election in the ward that I live in, in Edinburgh. And um, one of them said, have you ever thought about standing? And I said, can you imagine? <laughs> no, 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 because my face has got subtitles. Can you imagine what would happen? <laughs> I flashed them in. No, I can't. No, I can't do that. And then, um, then there was a sort of Mexican meal and some wine. And, <laughs> and before I knew it, I found myself thinking, aye, that'd be brilliant. <laughs> I could totally do that. I could, I could get these political people to defend the position. These people are members of a party where an MSP voted to take my rights away. I do want to stand in the hustings and ask them why they remain a member of that party. I will enjoy it. So now we've got a leaflet. <laughs> Laughing at nothing on the bridge. <laughs> Here I am, looking sad by a digger. <laughs> I mean, what says politician more than that, eh? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, because I'm standing as an independent, so I'm not, I'm not tied to any party whip, and I can pretty much say what I like. Except these women that are helping me, they're terrible. Um, so I do as I'm told. What I'll be able to do though is listen to residents' needs and what annoys them and present that without any undue influence. Because women really need local services. You know, if you want to go swimming and you have a faith-based requirement to only be amongst women, when they make it single-sex spaces and they take away the single-sex swim session, Muslim and Orthodox Jewish women don't go swimming anymore and neither do a whole heap of other women that just want to go swimming amongst women. Um, it's just like, exercise is so important for women, even people like me that don't do nearly enough because our health outcomes rely on exercise. Like women use buses more, but we need buses that go from playgroup to the supermarket to the chemist to go in, in, a, in a web like this. Caroline Criado Perez wrote about it in her book and nothing's changed. It's not okay. We don't need to go from the suburbs into town, we need to go all over the place. We use care services more because we live longer, unless some man beats us. We need refuges because some of us get beaten because we're abused more than men. We need bins in the right places because it's us that has to deal with the dog poo on the pram wheels, on the wheelchair, on the buggy. It really annoys me. I like being annoyed and good at it. <laughs> so I thought, these women have got a point because I do think that our politicians in Scotland have forgotten that they were elected to serve the citizens and not the party. So, I'm standing as an independent councillor in Kerstorf and Murrayfield, like I've got the voice and everything now. And, um, and to be perfectly honest, I mean to win. The women that are helping me, I mean, I'm saying about they're very bright, they really are, it's quite incredible, I'm, I'm on a learning curve like that. And um, what they've suggested that we do is we figure out how to do this and then we have a template that we can give to everybody else. Because they are not going to listen to us, that is evidenced. It's been a long number of years, they're not going to, we have to start from the bottom up and show them what women won't wish means. I'm going to have to say things like, how do you think that plan will impact on women and, and girls in the ward, councillor? I'm going to love it. <laughs> um, so there's barriers to standing as an independent, though. It's really quite shocked me. For a start, there's money. 
if you're in a party, you've got access to all sorts of money. So we had to do a crowdfunder and had set it up for six weeks to raise the £2,100, £29 I think I'm allowed to spend. And we raised it in four and a half hours. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought it'd be really, really hard work. And all these people that I didn't even know, like it gives you the names, and they might have been pseudonyms, but you know, you get the familiar faces. Most of the people, I've no idea who they were. They're just like, yeah, go on, get on with that. It was really moving. Um, if you are part of a party machine, you've got an infrastructure. You've got a mailing list, you've got the old polls, you've got the old electoral roll. You can actually get a heap of information. I have to start from scratch. I don't have a bus like one of the political parties <laughs> filled with people from their, um, their mailing list that are members to go and leaflet the whole area before the campaign starts. So it doesn't count in the budget for the election. I know. <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be, I, I know that I'll get people to help with leafleters and I'm really grateful because it's going to be a lot to do before just because my teenagers are a bit reluctant. <laughs> um, <laughs> the one that really surprised me was privacy. In order to stand, you need to have a, a bricks and mortar address and it would normally be your electoral officer. Well, that's my husband. <laughs> so he lives at the same place as me and um, we're traditional that way. <laughs> And I've had abuse for seven weeks or whatever from some people that would like to think that they're quite scary. Um, so I don't particularly want my children's home address being in the public domain. But there is no alternative. And when I phoned into the um, returning officer and I said, can I not use a PO box? No, it's against the rules. I said, well, you've got a duty of care for the candidates. And this has all been very spicy online, but that's not real. But once my address is there on 20,000 leaflets, really? Do you think that's actually okay? And he said, no, it's not. They know it's not. The government are looking at it. Brilliant. When will that be fixed? Because I've got until the 6th of February. 6th of March. 9th of March. Okay. 9th of March. Details, not my thing. But these clever women, they'll, they'll sort that out. Now, what I said to him was, like, I'll do it anyway, um, because I live in a cul-de-sac. Um, <laughs> they're going to look really stupid storming into a cul-de-sac <laughs> to do a protest. Um, and I'm fine with it. You know, the kids are fine with it. And it probably won't happen anyway, because you need to get two buses to get to where I stay. It's quite a lot of effort. And it's not easy to fit into your day when you don't get up until three in the afternoon. It's fine. <laughs> But see if we were a family that had adopted children or who fostered children, I would not be allowed to do that. That is not inclusion. It's not okay. So I'll be raising that. Um, <laughs> so the other thing that I've got going for me is I've lived in the ward for 20 years, so I know where all the potholes are. Um, I can address all of that and we've got a local problem with some roadworks that have been going on for an awful long time, made an awful mess and have ruined some local businesses. The one guy's lost 90% of his trade. So now the council are trying to hurry this job along and the diggers are working like at 11 o'clock at night outside people's houses and they've got to get up in the morning. So I thought, well, I can, I can deal with that because I've read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> And Arthur Dent went and lay in front of the digger that was going to knock his house down. So I can do that because it's only down the road. I'll go down there at half past eight and say, come on, half an hour more of your digging. And then I'll be lying there. I think that'll win a vote. <laughs> um, we just need more women in power. Um, and they don't even need to be the right sort of women. They just need to not be thick. Um, <laughs> stupid enough. Be stupid enough to accuse stroppy women of a crime on Twitter because you can unleash all sorts of things. This movement is full of really smart people, particularly women who are doing what they can when they can. And, and we've spoken about it all the people emailing, doing FOIs and raising petitions and doing stalls and challenging Primark and just galvanizing each other. Night Fourth Valley Feminists putting on this day, it really works. It's amazing. <laughs> Remember, if you're free next 
Thursday morning, half past 11, Holly would, we're going to tell them off about the jails. So the support I've had in this unexpected twist um, has been really humbling, and in return, I'm going to do my best. It's, deep, it's not words, isn't it? So I promise myself I will show everybody that I'm grateful for the encouragement, the money, the time, advice, and talent. And I want us to pay attention to what the fourth ballad feminists have got on their poster. Did you see? The backdrop today has been raise your voices and be heard. Women well, we have no intention of pushing. And I don't know why the government think that we're going to give up. It's fascinating. We will get our rights back. It might take a bit of time, but we will get them. And as a tweeter told me, she thinks that American's place is in the city chambers. <laughs> Get any of the love in the store for money feels. <laughs> <laughs>